I am currently trying to work my way through two years of backlogged footage, and I wish I was kidding, but there are about 100 or 150 pending video projects on this channel that I cannot deliver to you yet because they are not recorded in full, i.e. I recorded demos but not commentary in most cases, that's what's going on. And so, of course, I don't have the bandwidth to do much recording these days as a senior in mechanical engineering who also works on the side and takes gigs on the side of that. But I'm going to do my darndest to start whittling that down and bring you some long overdue reviews. Let's get started. How's it going, everybody? It's your host, Sam, here from the Samuel Plays Brass channel, as per usual, bringing you a really interesting review today. There are a lot of those coming up, but as mentioned, I am currently paying the price for recording a lot of demos and not a lot of commentary, so we are slowly working our way through the backlog. There was a time, two summers ago, back in 2022, when I was a lot more active working at Clearwater Music. This was before I had an engineering internship to work at. And basically every day I would record demos for at least one review, oftentimes multiple. I would get to work an hour or two hours early and just play around on whatever instrument or mouthpiece presented itself to me at the time. And working at a big shop like that, there is a lot to review. I don't even feel like I scratched the surface of instruments I wanted to review there. And unfortunately, the store is also closing down its retail department to focus on the repair side of things. So I missed my chance on a lot of really interesting instruments. The nice thing is, although a lot of these instruments I played a long, long time ago and wouldn't necessarily remember much about now, I was pretty judicious about taking notes about my playing impressions knowing that I might not get around to recording the commentary that day after work, for instance. And so I've got a lot of my impressions written down, I can listen to all the old demos with a fresh set of ears, and overall I think I can still deliver some good reviews on some really awesome instruments. So today we are talking about the Con Constellation Model 48H trombone. If you're not already familiar with the writings of Christine Dirksen on the Con Loyalist website, I would highly suggest going down to the description of this video and going to my little work cited that I try and do a better job of these days. Christine's writings have done a lot for me over the years. I pretty much consult them anytime I talk about the Con Company on this channel because they are an enormous company with a lot of history. They were one of the foremost brass manufacturers of the 20th century. And so there's a lot of good information on there that I tend to consult and synthesize in these videos. But it's important that I mention the enormity of the CG Con Company to start off our discussion because people might wonder, what is the Constellation line? What does it have to do with Con branding? Essentially, Con being the enormous parent company that it was, having various subsidiaries and various lines of instruments, split up their CG Con instruments in a variety of series, let's say the Artist series, the Victor series, and they had some that were sort of puns on the Con branding, such as the Con Quest, the Constellation, etc., and they would always have the dual N of the Con last name built into that, so Constellation comes out looking like it's spelled wrong, but it's really a, a pun on the Con branding, if you will. And specifically, I mentioned the names Artist, Victor, and Constellation, as those were Con's common professional lines of instruments back in the day. The Constellation line specifically was not always, but frequently hallmarked by nickel plating. A lot of the iconic Constellation instruments over the decades, be it the 28A cornet, the 38B or 36B trumpets, or indeed this 48H trombone, had this beautiful nickel plating. Now, while the vast majority of, if not just about all Constellation trumpets and cornets did have that distinct nickel plated exterior, along with, let's say, brass lacquered accents like the slide crooks, that wasn't always the case for Constellation trombones. And here I'm gonna do another plug for Ron from Ron's Garage, a friend of mine. You can find his channel up in the top right corner in the card. He does a lot of trombone rescues and restorations and collecting and whatnot. He says he has several hundred instruments. Uh, but he also posts frequently to the Con Trombone Aficionado page on Facebook. And here he posted a photo of three different Constellation trombones, numbered 28H, 38H and 48H, which is the one we're reviewing today. And what you'll notice from that picture is only the 48H has that nickel plating, which the constellations were famed for. The 28H and 38H are pretty rare birds. You don't see them too often. I think the 48's by far the most common constellation trombone, but these are all really interesting instruments. There are some differences in specs here. The 28 is very much in keeping with what you would expect of some of Khan's early director trombones and their early 4H model in that it has a 484 bore and a seven and a half inch bell. That is a fairly common, smaller vintage trombone size. It's really best suited for lead playing and sort of like salsa or ska work these days. A lot of people tend to use slightly beefier trombones for jazz. The 38H is the sort of tweener size. It's got that common .500 or 500 bore that a lot of jazz trombonists use, but its bell is still on the smaller side at seven and a half inches at the flare. Then the 48H 
is pretty much exactly what most people consider the quintessential specs for jazz playing. That's that same 500 bore, but an eight inch bell instead. And that is a very common combination. You see that on a lot of professional jazz trombones and student trombones as well. Notably, the Con 6H runs on those exact same specs. But make no mistake, even if they do have the same bore at the slide and the same bell diameter, the 48H and the 6H are actually very different players. Now, Ron's Constellation Stable is a really interesting glance through history, and I wanted to get a decent sense of that history. So I went to the Con Loyalist website and just took a look at the big table detailing all of the model numbers of trombones used throughout Con's history. History, and it really made me realize Khan's branding was a little wishy-washy in their early days because there are several trombones listed as the model 28H at different points throughout history and a couple of different 38Hs as well. But if we do look at specifically the constellation rows of 28, 38, and 48H, we'll see an interesting picture being painted. The 28H was in production from 1949 to 1953, at which point the 38H in 1954 took the stage until 1956, although that's not a very long reign by any means. And then in 1956, the 48H took over and was in production for about the next couple decades until the early to mid 1980s. First of all, I had not realized the constellation brand was around for that long. I thought it started in the mid-50s, but that's only when sort of the iconic nickel-plated constellations hit the scene. I guess there were constellation models before that. But moreover, there's a really interesting picture being painted in terms of trombones generally expanding in size over time. Because that first constellation from 49 to 53, to remind you, that was a 484 bore, a very small one, and a 7.5 inch bell. And then the 500 bore and 7.5 inch bell took the stage. And then we reach that sort of what's considered today ubiquitous 500 bore and 8 inch bell. Today's subject, the only 48H which I've personally gotten to play and examine myself, hails to us from the former half of its reign in the Con catalog. If we look at the bell engraving there, it says CG Con Limited, Elkhart, Indiana, and the serial number is in the 847,000 range, dating it to about 1960. These really were the glory days of Con's manufacturing, according to a lot of people. In the early 1970s, they relocated to Abilene, Texas, and the majority of Con instruments that I own are from the Abilene period, and I think they're all great players, but some people believe that there was a significant downturn in quality at that point, or at least that you were less likely to get a quality instrument from Khan at that point in time. Now, besides the 500 or number three bore and eight inch bell, there are a number of features that are really interesting on this trombone that you don't see on most other trombones out there. Even though this trombone runs on such standard specs and doesn't have any of the interesting amenities like an F attachment necessarily, it is a very unique instrument and one of Khan's top models into which a lot of research and experimentation and development was placed. So let's talk about a few of those features. We'll start off with the bell, and this is unfortunately not something we can inspect visually, but bear with me here. This was one of Khan's Electro D bells, which supposedly started its life much like any other bell as a hand-hammered sheet of yellow brass on a mandrel, but they didn't stop there. Usually you would just take that yellow brass and you would lacquer over it and you would call it done. No, Khan first took that yellow brass bell, plated it with a heavy coat of copper ions, which is pretty unusual, then plated it over with a bit of nickel, and only then was that old style epoxy lacquer baked on. That is a lot of layers compared to your typical brass bell, and it really has some interesting composition and tonal consequences. I think the mass is a little bit different than you would get with most yellow brass bells. Basically, nobody else was doing this, and I don't think it's stuck on a large mainstream scale, but you do get some really interesting qualities there. Additionally, we have some really unusual bevels on the bracing, a lot of extra metal in certain places, a lot less metal than you would expect in some others, like the slide handle, which is really oddly narrow, especially considering the brace on the mouth pipe. Now that's all well and good, but it doesn't really do anything for us unless we can talk about it in context of how the instrument plays, right? And this is where we start to reach some interesting conclusions. I'm going to try not to go on too much of a tangent here, but if you recall, I mentioned that the Constellation 48H shares its specs with the model 6H. And the 6H is one of the foremost jazz trombones in the world. It's up there with models like the King 3B, which I've also reviewed. You can find that in the card if you'd like. And the 6H is considered really the definitive jazz trombone sound, very ubiquitous and widely accepted by professionals all over the world. The thing with the 48H is it plays very differently even with the same specs. I think starting off, we should mention the extra copper plating typically darkens the sound of an instrument. It typically kind of creates a rounder projection pattern, a little bit less of the high and edgy frequencies in the sound. Those kind of get soaked up by the copper. And the same happens when you have a lot of extra weight on the bell, which is oftentimes the effect of not just copper plating, but the nickel plating on top of that, 
Overall, we have a fairly high mass bell compared to what I would normally expect out of a jazz trombone, and what I typically prefer, because to be honest, a lot of the time I do prefer a lightweight bell that resonates a little bit easier, but that extra copper and nickel seems to give the tone a certain extra subtlety and sort of a sultriness at softer dynamics, which turns out to be really good for old-timey ballads. <laughs> But as mentioned from a solely metallurgical perspective, whereas brass sits sort of in the middle of what you would expect for a brass instrument and copper leans towards the darker side of the fence, nickel tends to lean the other way and produce sort of a brighter, zippier, more focused and directional, maybe slightly edgier sound if you play it really loudly. And that seems to be the case to some small extent here. While the 48H is not by any means an exceptionally bright trombone, I think it can match the sort of punch that you get out of a King 3B or a Con 6H if you play it loudly, thanks to that coating of nickel. If the bell was the same amount of mass but it didn't have that nickel coating, I think it would be a little bit harder to attain that sort of sound, and you would end up with a trombone that sounded just a little bit woofy and undefined, and so I think Khan was onto something with this sort of multi-layered copper and then nickel under the lacquer. As mentioned, this trombone is not excessively or exceptionally bright, naturally speaking, but when you play it loudly, it honestly does attain that sort of bite in the sound, and it's not a bad choice for rock or metal work. <laughs> One really interesting advantage here of the fact that we're combining nickel plating with a generally heavier bell, if you were to just have a thin layer of brass, really lightweight bell, and plate it with nickel, the sound would break up pretty easily. You'd get to a point where you're putting more and more energy into the instrument, and eventually you stop being rewarded in terms of a brighter, more focused sound. It kind of breaks up and just gets ugly and harsh and gross, and you start double buzzing, overblowing the instrument. It's not fun. But I think the 48H really resists this by virtue of that really dense bell. You can put a ton of energy into it. And that's a hallmark, by the way, of thick copper planing, is you can seem to just put infinite amounts of energy into it without the sound breaking. And then the nickel helps to add that little bit of shimmer and brightness on top. And so between the material composition and the mass and the density of the bell, we get this really interesting amalgamation of qualities between loud and soft and bright and dark, where you almost have two horns in one, and you can really effectively almost like play a duet with yourself. I was having a lot of fun doing that on this horn. But overall, if I had to boil it down to one quality, bear with me on this analogy here, this trombone feels like it'd be right at home in sort of a monochrome vignette sort of setting, if you know what I mean. Um. The 48H Constellation is a really fabulous player. While there are certain other jazz trombones that I like a little bit more for certain reasons, this one is just a very enticing one to play. It's unique in the way it handles different dynamics, and it's really interesting to sort of push it to both extremes of the dynamic spectrum and see what that does to the tone. Like I said, it's almost like playing a duet with yourself. That's how crazy the tonal range is on this instrument, which I think is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. 
I think it was a little unfortunate that I only demoed this trombone with a Con 12C mouthpiece that wouldn't have even been in production until long after this trombone was made. It would have been nice to be able to test out a Constellation mouthpiece on it. A lot of them have this really iconic gold top silver shank look to them. And this is for sure going to be the subject of a big long video on the channel at some point when I have a little bit more time on my hands. But Regardless of what the mouthpiece looks like, I wish I'd tested a couple different cups because I don't really play on 12C stuff, so I don't know what my logic was in only testing out a more modern Con 12C on this vintage Con trombone, but nonetheless, what can you do? Now I've talked on this channel about my personal jazz trombone, which is a very special King 3B model that has an F attachment and a silver sonic bell, and my King 3B review will tell you more about that if you'd like. But the crux of it is I absolutely love that trombone, it's one of the best jazz trombones in the world, and I certainly don't intend to go jazz trombone shopping again anytime soon. But even with that in mind, and bearing in mind that I filmed these demos long before I'd ever tried a King 3B Silver Sonic, this is a fun horn, and it's honestly really interesting to examine these more unique jazz trombones and see what they bring to the table and why on earth it is that Khan would plate a brass bell with two different metals before lacquering it and what sort of thing that does and how that's different even with the same specs from something more, I guess, ubiquitous like a 6H. So I had a lot of fun making this video for you all, and I hope you enjoyed watching it. As a reminder, you can always go to my instrument review playlist up in the top right corner if you'd like to see more reviews, and there will be many more coming out soon because, as mentioned, my backlog stretches just about to the moon and back. But until that point, make sure to leave a like and a comment on this video. I appreciate you sticking around. We'll see you on the flip side. Yeah, you've played that one? Yeah, I, I, eighth grade, that was my ballad. Thanks for watching, everybody. If you want to support the creation of bigger and better content on the Samuel Plays Brass channel, have your name featured right here, and a whole host of other perks and benefits, then please consider pledging your support at patreon.com slash samuelplaysbrass. For now, you can find more videos in the end screen cards to my left.